Um, your food has a Jedi story. How do you tell the story and shine a light on underserved markets and food with the power of heritage? To moderate this panel, we have no one other than the inspiring and ambitious Marianne. Marianne has been dismantling the status quo and striving to create a world without borders for many years and has held annual summits at the New York Stock Exchange and the United Nations. She is the CEO and founder of Abyss Communications, a co-founder of the Jedi Collaborative, and currently serves as vice chair on the board of the American Sustainable Business Council. Marianne, please take the stage and kindly invite your fellow panelists. Thank you, Jasmine. And good morning, everybody. And a special shout out to Jenna and Arno for um, inviting me to be to my first Food Funded. And, and I get to um, have the opportunity to host uh, two remarkable success stories. So let's get right to it. We've got a lot to cover with these two phenoms with us today. Um, I'm anxious to hear and learn all about how they did it especially when um, we think about industries where the largest or those with the most growth among black owned businesses has historically been in healthcare, technology, automotive, retail trade, transportation, beauty, fast food franchises, natural foods, not at the top of the list. But Ibrahim Basir is one of our two entrepreneurs who's defined the odds and winning. And Ibrahim Basir, Ibrahim is the founder and CEO of A Dozen Cousins. I love that name. A natural, I can't wait to hear the story about A Dozen Cousins. A natural food brand that makes convenient products inspired by traditional Creole, Caribbean, and Latin American dishes. The brand is inspired by his childhood growing up in the culinary melting pot of Brooklyn and is named after his daughter and her 11 cousins. Prior to launching A Dozen Cousins, Ibrahim obtained his MBA from the Wharton School of Business and served as a marketing manager on a number of natural food brands. And Sana, now Sana, I haven't practiced your name. I'm gonna try this. Yaveri Kidri, Kadri. Sana. Uh, Sana Javeri Kadri. Okay. You try. Is the founder, founder and CEO at Diaspora Co, a direct trade single origin spice company dedicated to building a better spice trade by putting money, equity, and power into the hands of Indian farmers to disrupt and decolonize an outdated commodity and spice trading system. Sana is first and foremost an entrepreneur who has a bold vision and an indomitable spirit, having spent most of her time in her professional career building a now three-year-old business. She's a member of the Good Food Foundation's Equity Task Force. And since about four months ago, has joined as the youngest board member of the Specialty Food Foundation by a couple of decades, she's youngest, <laughs> and has had previous brief stints at Byright as a Digital Humanities Fellow at Claremont University Consortium and founded the Claremont Food Justice Summit before graduating from college. She thinks of her work and life's mission as using food as a tool for community, decolonization, and joy. So my first question for each of you is how important is social impact to your success story? And tell us why you started your business. Ibrahim, I'm gonna ask you to, if you go first. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Sun is one of my, my favorite entrepreneurs and Diaspora is one of my favorite brands. So I'm right very, very you. honored to be on this panel. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, first of all, to your question, Social impact is kind of at the core of why this brand even exists, you know, to, to give a little bit of backstory. I grew up in Brooklyn in a really big family. So I have nine siblings, 11 nieces and nephews. And then, you know, my daughter was the 12th cousin, which is, which is where the brand gets its name from. But I grew up with food just being this really special and, and important thing in our house. You know, that was kind of what kept us together, whether it was dinner at the end of the day or celebrating a holiday or, you know, marking a milestone. And so I always knew I wanted to work in the food industry. Um, fast forward many years, started my career working at a big CPG company, working on a number of different brands, and slowly started learning more and more about the natural product space. Um, understanding sourcing, understanding ingredient quality, understanding the impact of food on our bodies. And I eventually reached this point where it felt almost like 
this cognitive dissonance between what I was learning at work and what I was eating at home, right? Um, and they felt like they were in conflict, this idea of like, okay, you can either eat really healthy natural foods or you can eat these indulgent, cultural, kind of joyful foods that I had grown up with. And the whole idea behind A Dozen Cousins was to eliminate that, that perceived trade-off. You know, I wanted to create a brand that felt very cultural, very authentic, that like me and my family and my friends would love, um, but at the same time kind of leverage everything that I was learning about, you know, health and wellness. And so, you know, one of my goals with the brand and with the business is that we can eliminate the feeling or the idea that culture and health are somehow in conflict with each other. You know, I wanted them to feel very, very harmonious. And so, you know, I'll pause there in terms of the basic intro, but um, that, that's kind of at the heart of the brand. Okay, so so is your background mixed Cuban as well as uh, Mexican, <laughs> as well as Trinidadian or something? Because No, no, it's not, it's not. So I'm African-American, um, you know, by, by marriage, I have many Caribbean Americans in my family as well, and some of the cousins fall into that group. But, you know, the, the spirit behind the flavors and the region that we focus on is 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 more around like the the area in the world right so if you look at kind of the southern us down through south america it's obviously a blend of a lot of different cuisines right historically you've had indigenous people who were here in the land of course and they have foods and flavors you had this huge influx of african foods and flavors obviously through the slave trade and then you have european flavors that came through exploration colonization etc right and so you know, historically, people tend to look at the cuisine of this region in a very narrow way, right? Where it's like, okay, well, this is Mexican food and this is Jamaican food and they have nothing to do with each other. And I think if you study the history of the of the, of the region that we just talked about, it's actually a lot more interconnected than that, right? You have people who went from one place to another. You have foods and cooking preparations. If you look at the foods of Brazil and West Africa, in many cases, they're very similar, right? Because of some of that movement. And so one of the things I studied history as well. I'll just I'll sprinkle that in. Is like one of one of the, one of the things I love about the brand. But yeah, we we try to focus on look there. These the countries that we currently live in are, are artificial in many ways, right? It's more around the people and the history of the foods and the flavors, and, and that's what we focus on. Okay, all right. Well, I have a million more questions for you about beans, but let's go on over to Sana. Sana, can you tell us a little bit about your story and um, why you started Diaspora Co? Which, by the way. I went to go visit your website and I just felt completely in love. I've never tried the product, so I'm going to order some. We'll but... send you some. Oh, there you go. That's That was the right answer. But anyway, go ahead. Tell us about um, your story. Yeah, well, I, it's funny. I mean, uh, Ibrahim grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in Mumbai. And yet I feel like there's very similar stories there. I grew up in a big mixed up family. Um, I have... Uh, Iran, South Africa, Afghanistan, Gujarat, North India, South India, all mixed up in my family. Um, but we are, you know, a, a quintessential Bombay family. Um, and similarly, all of our meals were really how we came together. So, you know, our Sunday lunches would have South Indian near dosas with North Indian paneer. Um, and, and it's how it's how we overcame difference often. And and I mean real difference, like class difference and religious difference um, and I think but at the same time I was born in the 90s which meant that India opened up to uh, globalization so before 1992 India was a protected state pretty much where big multinational brands had not come in so I often talk about my childhood in India as um, we were the guinea pigs of capitalism where I remember when Coca-Cola came in and started marketing to us like I remember the summer that Nestle bought up all the airtime and suddenly convinced us that like store bought plastic, like plastic tubs of yogurt was better than homemade yogurt. Um, and so my understanding of food was actually in opposition to the natural foods movement. It was like processed is better. Fruit roll ups are the best thing ever. Um, and like Mac craft Mac and cheese is like gourmet cuisine um, because that's what globalization did to the Indian market. And then I came to California for college eight years ago and was just like very confused. Suddenly they were talking about like artisanal farm to table. And I was like, what about Taco Bell? I thought that was, you know, I really thought that was the upper echelon of cuisine um, and realized that India was moving on this express train towards American style industrialization of agriculture. 
um, instead of staying true to its roots of indigenous kind of natural farming. And um, so my thesis and a lot, of, a lot of my course of study was around this, was around this disconnect. And, and I quickly realized that colonization played a huge role in setting India up for that, where when you ask an Indian farmer, you know, when did your grandfathers use pesticides? Did they grow without pesticides? That's not true because the British were giving them pesticides to experiment with 200 years ago. So they, there is no memory of like a rosier, natural, organic time that doesn't exist. So anyway, fast forward to my time. 2016, I was working in marketing at Byright. Um, I loved my job. I, I couldn't believe that I had to, I got to like photograph oranges for work. Um, and I didn't know that there were so many different kinds of citrus either. But similarly had this draw towards history um, and to deeper stories. And, you know, what the story that I love was the fact that citrus went from China to Brazil to up to California. Um, but instead, we were now using this very gold rush story of citrus as like a deeply Californian thing instead of the greater context around it. And so I just realized that I wanted to I wanted to tell more complicated, deep stories. Um, and I didn't know what lens through which I would do that. Um, further inquiry made me realize that, you know, nobody knew where their spices were coming from. I was asking buyers, I was asking chefs, um, and they were all like, well, you know, I guess they come from India. Somebody, somebody had the audacity to say to me like that, um, they must be organic because India is too poor for fertilizers. And I was just like, wow. um, so that I think there was just an understanding that there must be more people like me who want to understand the full story of something and who believe that um, farm to table doesn't just have to extend within local, like it can happen globally. So anyway, that's the, the long story of how we ended up with Diaspora Co, which is now a single origin spice company, which means we work with small organic Indian farmers, often farmers who are transitioning their farms to organic for the very first time in three or four generations um, and we buy all of their whatever they grow um, and sell it here in the United States mostly direct to consumer um, and we, we say that we're kind of decolonizing the spice trade. Hmm. Sana, your story about um, how um, colonization of, of food entered into India with the you know processed food story um, reminds me of what happened here in the U.S. back in the 60s when when the Watts riots occurred and and um, the, the the country was in turmoil and um, a then president uh, it might have been Johnson was thinking about how do we how do we how do we address these issues in other words find a way to um, mitigate the, the 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 inequities in the community and decided that a way to do that was was by creating a McDonald's had been introduced into the market as a successful food franchise idea in the suburbs and thought, well, why don't we concentrate them in the urban communities and create these opportunities for black people to, to own these franchises. And that became such a focus in the, in the, in the U.S. enterprise market for minority owned businesses that what ultimately wound up happening is what we have today, which are these fast food belts, which, you know, permeate our, our community and have taken mm -hmm. over our you know, our primary food um, supply, right? So we have food deserts, but we got plenty of McDonald's and Win Miss Winners and KFCs, right? So, so, so which brings me back to Ibrahim, because given that we, especially in the African-American community, what kinds of foods are pushed, marketed, heavily marketed and invested in and, and therefore um, pervasive throughout our community, which cause all kinds of heart disease and, and bad health conditions. And now you're doing something that is going against the grade. And so there's got to be kind of an education process, I'm thinking, in, in, in your success story about how, how are you able to um, break through that crowd and, and be successful with, with um, a dozen cousins? Yeah, uh, first of all, it's a great question. You know, I'll say a couple of things. The first is that, you know, when we first started the business, one of the big areas of focus for me was trying to find a product and a product category that would lessen the, that mental conflict that you're talking about, right? I wanted to find something that people had a natural attraction to and connection with, which is the reason that we started with beans, right? I grew up eating 
black eyed peas. My mother's from South Carolina. She would cook them all day. Um, red beans, right, from Louisiana. Um, if you grew up in the Caribbean, black beans, pinto beans in Mexico. These, these are foods that I actually think there's a lot of love for. And so for us, you know, we think of our value add as making them really convenient, making the ingredients in them much more high quality, right? So instead of using lard or animal fat, we're using avocado oil, right? Instead of using um, a lot of salt or garlic powder or onion powder, we're using real garlic and real onions. And so, you know, I do think that helps with some of the conflict where it's like, hey, the beans are a food that, that we kind of love. And in some ways it feels almost like we're reintroducing people to this food in a way that is a little more premium, a little more high quality. Um, and I know Marianne, I'm not seeing you on my side. I don't know, son, are you able to still see Marianne? I am. Okay, cool. I don't know why I lost you, Marianne, but um, hopefully you can hear, hear me. But it that, looks that's great. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So yeah, so hopefully, yeah, hopefully that made sense. You know, for us, I've, I've found that people have embraced the product. You know, there's always going to be that conflict from a socioeconomic perspective of like, what communities can afford to buy premium foods. And, and some of those problems are much deeper than we can address as a brand. But, you know, we think of our initial role as creating a product that people would be desirous of, that they will enjoy when they eat it, that they'll value when they have it in their hands. And, you know, so far, I feel happy that we've been able to do that. Okay. And you do it very well. And I, and I love the, the, um, the, the way that you market it, which is, and I'm a, I come from a brand communications marketing background. My company, Ibis Community, specializes in that. So I had a really special appreciation for your imagery, your packaging, you know, the way that your website looked and, you know, the soulfully, soulfully seasoned product line and the names uh -huh. of your products, they, they, they they say it all. You can almost hear, you know, taste the flavors in the names of your products, which was brilliant. And then Sana, you know, <clears throat> your food justice and retail marketing and communications background came through loud and, and clear. And your social, do you write your own social media? Are you the I one? I do. I'm oh, the my. human. I'm the human over there. You're very good. You're very, very good. Even in, I've looked in your social media feed and the conversations and how you respond because marketing, and I say this to all of my clients, it's more than a logo. It really is every touch point is every point of contact, even how you say hello. And you do that all very well. And you describe your business as being radically different. Um, Sana, how, yeah. how radically different? Yeah, well, um, to start with, it's there's me. Um, as of as far as I know, I'm the only woman of color in direct trade spice sourcing. Um, that like, I mean, it's a big industry. McCormick's, the Lowry's of the world. Um, the, the fact that there's nobody that looks like me in this industry um, speaks to who's had power for a really long time. Um, that's part one. Uh, part two is most spices tend to be between five to seven years old. So your, you know, the McCormick cinnamon or allspice on your shelf is probably from the 2012 harvest right now. Um, whereas everything that we source is same year harvest, because that's the way I grew up having it at home where it grows in March by April, you know, it's ground and dried and you're using it and by December you're done and you're anxiously waiting for the rest or for the next harvest. So we're bringing a new era, really of freshness to spices. Um, and in terms of equity, this word is used so much right now, of like direct trade, fair trade. Um, and I, I find it a bit ridiculous where, um, you know, you can't call something fair trade when it's only 15% more than the commodity price, which is requiring the farmer to take, you know, a 10% interest rate loan or a 10% monthly interest rate loan. So we tend to pay between six to eight times the market price um, to our farm partners. Um, and that comes from literally sitting with them and saying, what is your water bill? What is your labor bill? Like, how much money do you actually need to run this sustainably? Great. Let's start with paying you that and we will figure out our pricing from there. And that's where, you know, we really succeed in the D 2 C space because in the wholesale distributor space, we wouldn't be able to make the system work. Um, and now we actually provide healthcare to any farm that we buy more than two metric tons from, which is now all six of our farms, which means that anybody that works on the farm, a daily wage farm laborer, they have like full access health care, which during the pandemic really came into play where everybody on our turmeric farm got coronavirus and we were able to 
ensure like super high level care to every single person on the farm. So that's radically different um, in terms of messaging and you know how we cut through the noise of it and how we've been seen. I started the company with, with 3K from my 2016 tax refund and like didn't know anybody because I was 23 years old. So like we didn't have a big, we didn't have any marketing budget. Um, I started paying myself two months ago. I think it was really just social media. Like it, social media gave me a voice for free. And so I used it as often as I could, as much as I could. I said the same thing over and over again, being like, this is why decon, like this is what decolonization looks like. It's ongoing work. Like we're constantly evolving as a as a brand towards a more ethical business model. Um, and people have listened, but I definitely think three years in, there's starting to be a lot of copycats and starting to be a lot of people using the same words as us um, with much bigger budgets. And I think my next challenge is like, how do we rise above that? Hmm. Well, I gosh, I just love the way that you described how you work with your partners, that it's it sounds like it's a very mutual relationship and you're investing in one another to yeah. help you grow, right? And so, um, which, which um, uh, Ibrahim, you, one of the things that I, I was reading about you that I thought was really impressive, and I'd love for you to share with your audience is this, your, the idea of Project Potluck, which is specifically focused on helping BIPOC thrive in the, in the consumer product goods industry. And so, and I, and I know my very dear friends at Beanfields um, and then Mason Dixie, Dixie Foods have joined with you to do this. So can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, I can, you know, so, you know, as I mentioned, I started my career in the CPG space. I've been working in this industry in different, you know, forms, fashions, angles for about 10 years. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so special about CPG is the fact that almost everyone in the country is a customer of, of our of our industry, right? In the sense of like, whether you're brushing your teeth, washing your hair, washing your hands, cooking your food, cleaning your floor, right? Like these are daily purchases, daily habits. And so in some ways, one of the most like democratic industries in America, right? Um, and so to me, the onus then is really, really high that the people who have power in this industry and influence in this industry and who get to shape the products that they reflect the people who they're who they're serving, right? And so really the, the idea behind Project Potluck started just looking at the data, you know, depending on the data set you look at, anywhere between 40 and 50% of the people in the US identify as being a person of color. Um, if you look at how that trickles into the natural product space, it's something like 15% of company boards, a little slightly lower percentage of company leadership teams. And so the whole idea behind the initiative was what, will, what, what could we do or what will we need to do in order to make the percentage of founders, the percentage of leadership team members, the percentage of board members kind of match the country at large. And so ultimately what we landed on was um, an industry organization, right? Really focused on helping people of color build successful companies and careers. We're focused on mentorship. We're focused on community. We're focused on um, access and visibility, right? Making it easy for people to find jobs and opportunities and, and likewise making it easy for people who are hiring to find us. Um, and we're, we're in the very early stages of it, you know, it launched um, last month and we're really excited about it. You know, the goal very simply is to be like 50 more people like Sana and I, if, you know, next year and uh, 200 more people like us two years from now, right? Like we're going after a particular opportunity in the market that's very clear to us, but the reality is other people have different perspectives, different experiences, different networks, different talents to kind of present to the world. And so hopefully one of the legacies of the program will just be a really great set of companies and products. That's phenomenal. And, and so, so necessary. So I mean, there, there are government, you know, programs that have been set up to design to help businesses and, and there are a number of uh, organizations. But one of the things that I think is unique about what you're doing is that because you are a minority entrepreneur and understand the obstacles and the challenges, your, your one role modeling and being able to be a mentor and being able to really truly understand the nuances of what it takes in order to be really successful. And so, and on that note, I'd like both of you to talk a little bit about, because both of your businesses are really young. Sana, you've only been doing this for three years, right? And then Ibrahim, how, how old is your business? Uh, it's about two years old. So we, la we launched in January of 2019. So we're, we're around our second year. Yeah. That's ridiculous. 
that's ridiculous that you guys are, are doing this well that quickly. So, the, right. So, so um, first tell us what has been the biggest obstacle in starting your business and how you overcame it. And then I'm going to ask you um, what has been the thing that has, what you would attribute your success to. But first, let's talk about your obstacles. Sana, you want to go first? Yeah, um, and and I, I wanted to jump in on what Ibrahim was saying about Project Potluck and the fact that like there aren't there aren't very many entrepreneurs that look like us, and the dream is for for a lot more to be out there. And you know, it was a bit of a wake up call to me this year where three BIPOC led business like food ventures um, shut down with the pandemic, and uh, whereas I was seeing a lot of my white led peers actually saying that this time was a time of like unparalleled creativity and growth and it it really showed who suffered during the pandemic and who didn't which which hurt and i think ibrahim and i both doubled down to be like okay this needs to change like next next hit we come out stronger um but in terms of obstacles for me um you know i moved here eight years ago with two aunties in the u.s um i don't have a network i didn't like obviously college gave me some but the main thing was not knowing who to ask for, for help, for funding, um, which is why we weren't, we haven't been funded in any form um, and not having mentors to ask those questions to. Um, I have gotten very good at the blind ask and writing the very charming email to ask for help because I've had to, um, but I can see how a lot of my peers, you know, have not been able to do that. The other one is, is financial. Um, Luckily, I had a blessing of a freelance photography career that like just sprouted when I was starting Diaspora Co. So that for the first almost two years of Diaspora, I was earning my salary by doing one or two photo gigs a month that paid my rent. Um, and I had a partner who just hustled so that, you know, we our budget was covered. Um, and I know that a lot of BIPOC entrepreneurs don't have that privilege to, to do one gig a month and pay your rent. Um, so the, the financial piece of how are you, you personally going to get paid during the early years, um, has, has been tough to navigate. Yeah. I don't, I can't remember what the second part of your question was. Well, I'll ask Ibrahim to talk okay. about the, the thing that, that he overcame as well, but, and then I'll come back to you because we want to understand what is the secret to your success. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I start just first by saying that I feel very fortunate that we have a business which is growing and, and pays my salary and that people enjoy and so whatever obstacles I faced are obviously not that big because we're still here and we're, and we're moving forward, right? So I, I want to preface that, you know, with that said, you know, I would say probably the biggest obstacle you face is something that I've come to just call like the credibility gap, right? Which is um, every time you talk to a partner, you have to prove to them that you're like worthy of their time and effort and energy, right? Which is not the experience that I have working for a large company. It's not an experience that I've really dealt with for most of my life, if I'm being honest, right? Where it's like you walk into a room, usually people, they know you, they respect you, they know your company, they want, they want your business. And so you get kind of the full treatment. And then as an entrepreneur, it's like, we have to convince a co-packer to produce our product. We have to convince um, a sales broker to, to represent our business, right? You have to pitch retailers and, and we have a slightly more traditional business in that we, we do sell to a lot of retailers and wholesalers and things like that. So it's just a lot of people that need to buy into the, the idea. Um, and I think when you layer on top of that, what we're selling, right, which is beans and this thesis around black and Latino culture is on the rise, like not everyone gets it, you know what I mean? And so I think just now we're getting to a point you know, as we approach the second half of year two, where I think people understand the vision for the brand a little more clearly. And then some of those conversations are a little smoother, but I would say certainly for the first, you know, year, year and a half, it was just around that, that credibility gap. <clears throat> so, so we only have a few more minutes. So we're going to, this, we're going to wrap with you, you talking about what made you so successful, but Ibrahim, let me ask you, this is, do, I'm assuming that you had a business plan that you, you, you all ready to go and is everything going according to plan um it is man it is we, we you know we're uh, sorry to cut you off actually let me let you make sure you ask no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, no i was just gonna say we're you know we're, with coronavirus we happen to be in the group that that has been an accelerant for our business right and so you will probably end up ahead of plan right people are cooking more at home they 
Um, they're eating lunch at home more than they used to, right? And um, they're, they're buying more every time they go shopping. So shelf-stable products and products that last longer are, are in more demand, right? So there's like a number of underlying trends that have made the product uh, more compelling over the last six months. And so all in all, we're, we're doing well. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, Sana, you, I think you, we got three more minutes. Let's so wrap it up in three minutes. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, we have grown three X year over year for the past three years. And this year we're going to hit four X, which is pretty wild um, and exciting. Um, I, I love what Ibrahim said about the credibility gap as a 23 year old showing up on farms. Nobody took me seriously. I pretended to be 30 for a long time. Um, nobody bought that either. Um, and, and yeah, I think the secret to our success, I think has just been people were ready for it and people wanted it. Um, big, big brands maybe didn't realize how many customers were eager for kind of a, a more nuanced storytelling and flavors that actually tasted like home. You know, so many people tell us that our turmeric actually tastes like turmeric. Um, yeah. Okay. Too much pressure. One minute left. Oh. Yeah, no, that was great. Well, do you want to take the last minute and tell us all, tell your audience where they can find your products and what we can do for you at this point? Yeah, um, I'll jump in and you can find us at www.diasporaco.com. Um, the trio is probably your best way to get started with us. Um, it's very good pepper, chilies, and turmeric. Um, and then we're also very active on Instagram, which is just at Diaspora Co. Okay. All right. Thank yeah, you. Very, oh, no, I was going to say very similarly, a dozen cousins.com. If you start there, we'll, we'll take you everywhere else you need to go. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your remarkable story. You two are ma you're inspirational for me. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I look forward to my delivery, Sana, that you promised of my, <laughs> I want, I want, I, got all, to. I want all eight spices in that nice tray <laughs> with a lot of crab on it and personalized <laughs> that one. <laughs> Big ask. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Ibrahim and I also yeah. share a warehouse, so I can just pop some beans in. Okay. Yeah, sprinkle, sprinkle some in. We'll get you. We'll, I'll get you some beans as well. Uh, yes, yes. I'm looking forward to my beans. I love beans. <laughs> wow. Cool. Thank you, guys. Wow. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Yeah, big thank you to all the pan panelists. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Sana. Um, truly enlightening session. Um, great to hear you all speak.